going to have to overpay him to keep him here. The question is, how much are you willing to overpay him? But on a team like this that's so depleted, that has so much cap room, it doesn't hurt you as much to overpay a player if you have to. How you treat your players does resonate in the league, and that, that is a big deal. So the reason I feel like the Bears almost need to pay Jalen Johnson is A, for team culture, and just showing some sort of commitment to guys who perform in-house. And that kind of adds like almost like $2 million per year towards how much you need to overpay him. So if Jalen Johnson is a $16, $17 million a year guy, to kind of prove a point, you should pay him eighteen, nineteen. telling Paulie all summer that like I'm not I don't have the balls to say on the channel or like make it public but like I've been telling Paulie I'm like Justin Fields is not the future like he's gone probably by year two you're crazy I I, <laughs> I want him to be I think he's good enough to be I think I think oh, this is gonna be perfect is gonna, is gonna replace yeah, I, him Paulie hates me for it I think no, he's gone fucking, too. I think he's gone. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. No, I do hate you for it. Yeah. You think he's think, gone next year? I think they'll take him through five, and um, I think they'll bail. I think they're gonna bail. I think I by think, that time, like we're either. I hope. I think ideally we have gotta, to be good enough then that we won't be in position to, to draft the quarterback. So is, I feel like, and this is where if the polls wants lies, out. He'll have, have to do it. First round picks, and one of them is probably going to be a top five this year. When are, when Man, else are you I hope do so. This? When else are you going to do this, though? You're going to take Drake May or Caleb Williams if you got it. Last year at the start of the season, Vegas had this team at six and a half wins. And the Bears underperformed and, and wound up with a three-win season. Now, after all the offseason acquisitions and the, the draft trade and the draft picks and everything like that, Vegas now this year has this team at seven and a half wins. So they've only seen a one-win upgrade. And... You know, for all the fans out there projecting 10 or 11 wins, it, it's a hard argument to make because you're expecting them now to overachieve by, you know, three or four games. So, uh, you know, what uh, what's more of the realistic expectation here? I think you nailed it with uh, Vegas. Me and you go more on math and statistics and we go on Vegas, right? Vegas has been consistent for, for years and over time. And like you said, so if Vegas had the Bears at six and a half wins last year, and you would consider this team an underperforming team last year, and you have them at seven and a half wins this year, you're looking at a team that is mathematically just basically a one game better team. So if this is a team that underperforms, we are looking at a similar season to last year, like you said. So an underperforming team, one game better, we're a four win team. You know that's that's gonna hurt. That's gonna be really painful. And uh, if if you're an overperforming team, and that's the argument you want to make, um, one of my favorite commentators, Yurko, is always saying that this was a six or seven win team last year that only won three games. And while I love it and I agree, generally speaking, you know, you are what your record says you are. This year, if you are hoping to overperform, right? So if you're underperforming from last year. You're saying that it was a six and a half win team and it, they only won three games. Underperforming is three games. I don't think so. I think that's like a one or two game thing. So if you're overperforming, let's say you're seven and a half wins, you should be eight, nine wins. Yeah. So I just, uh, I quickly wanted to just share some of my thoughts on Chase Claypool. Now, uh, listen, I want Chase Claypool to have a good season. I want him to have a career season if he can. Uh, I want the best for the Bears and for this offense. I just, I have a really rough time seeing it happen. And, and how it's going to happen. Because, like, you know, one of my friends who's a Steelers fan, when I asked him about Chase Claypool, he said, you know, immediately when we drafted him, he went into the locker room and he was the number one wide receiver his first year. And yeah. it was, uh, you know, obvious. And, uh, <laughs> you know, hearing notes out of camp right now, that's what you're getting out of DJ Moore. It's like, whoa, this guy's obviously the num a number one wide receiver. Sure. However, we never got that with Chase Claypool. He came here, he was kind of lost, didn't fit in. 
Um, you know, it just seems like he's kind of always behind the eight ball a little bit. Now, for having that kind of size, that speed, he just doesn't seem to use his body well. Remember, like, when we drafted Adam Shaheen and he was the same size Ugh. and weight as Gronk? And everybody's like, oh, baby Gronk. And, and no, nah, he just didn't know how to use his body in that in that physical way. It kind of seems the same thing with Chase Claypool to me a little bit. A lot of body catches. He struggles, you know, when, when corners are covered all against him. He's kind of more looking for the flag than looking to make the play. Like Brandon Marshall, when we had him here, he would still he would still get a hand on the ball. He would still, no matter what, flag or no flag or whatever, he's getting up in the air. And there's a certain physicality that, I don't know, I, I just feel like Chase Claypool lacks. And so, you know, I hope this arrow starts pointing up soon. Because to me, it's just kind of stayed flat, if not pointed down a little bit. And so, I, you know, I, I believe he's kind of a high volume guy, too. He's going to need a lot of targets, I think, to get better. And I don't know if he's going to find them in this offense uh, with the way it's looking. So I, I just I don't know. I don't know how he's going to turn around. I hope he does, but I just don't see it happening. I know you were the only one that was really talking it down, kind of saying, hey, let's put, pump the brakes a little bit on this and, you know, I got a lot of a lot of flack for that on YouTube and whatnot. People are, you know, disagreeing mm-hmm. and whatnot. But when you when you go back and listen to it, I mean, you're pretty spot on there. Um, what I expect from the Packers in the passing game is a lot of play action, a lot of slants, and giving the ball to receivers and playmakers in space and letting them do what they do. You know, we can make fun of Jordan Love all we want about training camp videos and all that stuff. I think he's quite comfortable in the system. And I think he's had an opportunity to be in Matt LaFleur's offense, and I think he can perform it. This is all speculation because we haven't seen it. But I think at at worst, what we can expect is a 50% completion and 200-yard game from Jordan Love. Um, Do you think Fields throws for over 200 yards? I'm not sure, but at the end of the day, I trust Justin Fields to do what he needs to do to drag the corpse of the Chicago Bears across the finish line. Down to, you know, being iffy about if Fields can throw for 200 yards and being pretty confident that Jordan Love will throw for at least 200 yards. And yeah, Fields barely just broke that at the end. Um, You even mentioned how once you start pressing the ball, you're going to throw a pick. And we saw a pick six in this game. couldn't stop the Packers run. Sat there, they kept gushing us seven yards on first down over and over. Meanwhile, just like you said, we wind up in these third and long situations over and over and over again. Which are- <clears throat> it was the worst nightmare come true. It is so much worse than I could have imagined and thought what would happen. Um, I was being hopeful for sure and being optimistic and setting, you know, like the Bears to win and everything, but I definitely will reevaluate my hopes moving forward. When you look at certain guys that play those positions, Tom Brady's my favorite. Um, even when trying to pull tape on Joe Burrow, there isn't, you know, I tried to put a highlight video of one of Joe Burrow's playoffs games. I couldn't do it. There was, there was no 20, 30 yard passes. It was just three yard pass, eight yard pass, you know, a couple yard run, 10 yard pass, four yard pass. It's just, it's like cutting you with a knife, but the knife's a little sharper than Tom Brady had. It, it's, meticulous and they just take what the defense gives them i believe at at some point if you're going to look at a long-term outlook here you need a guy at the quarterback position that is going to be capable of just taking whatever the defense gives them you need to be able to read the defenses and process it and it's just some field's third year there's a lot of concern that this isn't clicking in his head i mean Stats are very comparable to Mitch Trubisky. Mitch Trubisky actually has better stats if you look at the numbers. You know, eye test will tell us that, of course, Fields is a much, much, much better, more experienced athlete. But it's, you know, the results are the results. I think if it keeps going the way it's going, I think what's most likely to happen is, and it was my bold prediction that Fields is going to start all 17 games. Yeah, <laughs> throw that out the window. He's He's going to get hurt. He's going to get hurt. He's taken so many sacks over or even over his career he's one of the most sack quarterback i believe he's taken like a total of over 100 sacks while patrick mahomes has taken maybe nearly half that in the same time span um i want to say david carr 
has the or no Andrew Luck has the most sacks through like seven years of a career, and Justin Fields is on pace to double it. You know he had two interceptions in this game, um, but one of them being a pick six at the most crucial part of the game. Um, for the one touchdown that Chase Claypool did catch, uh, and he put a little bit more effort into blocking, there's still a lot of confusion on his end. You can still see him looking at the sideline, kind of going, shrugging his shoulders here and there, not knowing what it, what's what. I believe I saw a quote from him saying that there were plays where he thought were run plays that wound up actually being screen passes. Um, that's what happens when you miss a lot of the offseason. You're, you're still behind. Fields looks lost out there. He does. And listen, there's when you dive into the play calling itself and when you dive into the routes being ran and now – you know, we we're not we're not in the room, so we don't know what the play that's being called actually is, and we don't know if somebody out there is just messing it up, messing up a route and not knowing what to do. And that could very well be the case. It could definitely fall on the player. For guys like me and you, just sitting at home on our couches, even just looking at A twenty two tape and things like that, we go, "What the hell is this?" Like even when you draw it up on a whiteboard, it just doesn't make sense. It's almost idiotic to think that they would sit there and teach this. I truly believe it's got to be on the field execution that's messing this up because there's no way that they're running two of the same routes next to each other. There's no way that these two offensive players wind up in a you know three to five yard radius of each other when the ball needs to be thrown. I mean, there's just sloppiness everywhere. And I mean, I guess at the end of the day, that does fall on coaching. You don't have these guys ready to go or you're putting guys in there who are not ready to go. Fields, you know, what concerns me is there are open reads, early open reads. They're not being hit. You got DJ Moore out there clapping at you. Give me the ball. You know, th there's plays where, like, uh, there was one play where Claypool was wide open just staring at Justin Fields. By the time Fields got the ball out, he threw it so high that Claypool barely got a fingertip on it, and the ball, you know, popped up, and I think it fell out of bounds. But it could have potentially even been intercepted there. And it, it's just sloppy execution on your layups. Like, if, if you're ever going to win with Justin Fields, it, he needs to be able to do the – the easy things at least now i think where the fault comes in is they're not i think they're throwing this all at him at once they haven't really progressed him and made him feel comfortable in in a, in a, a progressive offense keeping the things that he does well in there as well as adding on and i and i believe you said that you know when we did a podcast with swifty hey you need to build off of what you did last year you need to just add dj more into it you know you don't you don't need to revamp this whole thing and try something new again like just because you got a sh bunch of shiny new toys as you've been saying the problem here is when things go wrong this much i don't think you can lay it all on any individual player it's it's a team sport it's a full 11 man sport you can't put it all on one guy and the quarterback is included in that so even if the quarterback can't read the defense or the or the routes or whatever's going on you can't ask him to do things that he's not capable of and i just don't think that justin fields is capable of this and it, it, it sucks we all love justin fields we love him we wanted him to become like the next 10 year guy um but the quick realization is just like he just can't process defenses like this and um can't process process like reads like this and it, it's just it's really all bad but when you have something in this situation to me, the fundamental question comes down to what are you trying to execute? And if you're trying to win games, you can do better than this. You can run the ball more. You can run play action more. You can uh, run simpler plays that aren't just screen passes. You can do things that will put your quarterback in a position to win. If you're trying to execute your system, come hell or high water, you're doing a great job. I think if you're trying to... I think you mentioned, you know, they ran Roshan Johnson and got 30 yards off it. Then never did it again. Never did. Why are you why are you doing things that don't work and not doing the things that work? Yeah. I mean, so um you you would hope that professionals at, at their job are self-aware enough to understand things that they're good at, things that they're not good at. Fields is clearly just mentally broken and 
it's a long season. Could he snap out of it? Sure. We've seen crazier things happen in the NFL where guys just have one or two games of crazy success and then just have confidence and moving forward. They're just a totally different guy. Can it happen? Yes. Are my, are my uh, hopes up high for that? No, no, they're not. Any major mistakes fields had this game? What are they? Letting two free rushers. And this is what I really don't like about that Getsy quote. Is you're saying you've got a dirty uh, a dirty edge, right? What he said. That was not a dirty edge. If the blind side rusher didn't get him, guys, go watch that play. There was another guy on the other on the other end. So that was not a, a sack where, oh, he didn't see that guy coming. He was getting sandwiched. He was getting absolutely demolished. On the strip you, sack fumble, Justin said the rule there is just don't take a sack on naked through bootlegs. What what can what's the coaching point there if he has his back turned? in those situations so that doesn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, he, we just talked about the goal line play was exactly the same thing. And so whenever you whenever you know you have what we refer to as a dirty edge, which every pretty much every uh, bootleg keeper that we have is a dirty edge, you got to come out high. And when you recognize that the rusher is high, you got to pull up. And so uh, he didn't do that on that particular one. He did it on the other one and created a touchdown for us. And so uh, that's part of that learning experience that you get in games and seeing the way everybody's game planning you specifically. Gosh. If he didn't fumble that ball by the first hit. So now he's being told is don't take a sack. And don't take a sack. I, I want you to step up, use your athleticism, and make a play that you know three guys in the league can make. Great. Awesome coaching. The way he explained it there, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding or he didn't explain it very well, but he explained it like a dirty edge is just something that happens regularly. Like a free rusher is just gonna happen regularly all the time on his play designs. And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? No. <laughs> That's not how it's supposed to go down. They're not supposed to have free rusher. Every so the defense, it looks like they've made a turn. So do you think they'll continue to play better football like we've seen the last several weeks? Do I feel this defense has made a turn and will play better football like we've seen in the last few weeks? I think so, yes, for many reasons. Much of what you guys said is the reason why I think it's improving, and it is a credit to Matt Eberflus. A lot of it also is purely based on health. You have your nickel cornerback, which is one of the most vital parts of this defense, back. You had Kyler Gordon sit out the first six weeks. He's coming out. He's making hits. He's doing blitzes really well. He replaces Jack Sanborn in those little nickel package situations. And your defense is gelling. And this is this was my point to begin with. You have a defense where all four starters on the defensive line were switched out. All three linebackers were completely switched out. We're talking about seven guys out of 11 that were not playing together last year, including the fact that Eddie Jackson was hurt for the entire end of the season, that Jaquan Brisker and Jalen Johnson were hurt towards the end of the season. You guys had, you know, starting cornerbacks that aren't even on this team. So it is a big deal. It is important to see defenses that are consistent and gel together because you have defenses in the NFL that don't have as much skill that play much better than this. Reset. Oh, you're hitting the reset button. You're hitting the reset button. You're not. To sit there and think that a guy can't come in into the situation and have some success, I think it's bonkers. In fact, 100%. most number one overall picks come into a way worse situation. It fell into our laps. Like you said, we're gambling with house money. Now, listen, I'm all in for Fields being our starter. If, I don't know, Carolina won a couple more games. We have like pick seven and pick nine. I'd be like, no, I'll build around fields. That that'd be your best bet. Like he is adequate enough and average enough. But but at that point, I'm still not sold that we're gonna win a Super Bowl with him. Like the he's still in my matters. mind, it does matter. So the fact that the number one overall pick fell into our lap, that's going to most likely give you a much better result than Justin Fields will. What you really, really truly need in this league to go all the way. And I just don't think we're gonna go all the way with Justin Fields. I did more work on Caleb Williams and there is a lot to be excited about from him. He makes sure to set his feet really fast before he throws. He never makes a stupid errand throw because of that. And he does get away from the sack really well. They anticipate him beating four six at the combine. So he's still gonna be a fast quarterback, not as fast as Justin Fields, but his escapability is still there. Not as escapable as Justin Fields, okay? But he always places the ball on the numbers, even when he's on the run. The consistency that he puts it right on the receiver's chest so that they can just catch the ball and run, that, that is important in and of itself. He does get the ball to all three levels. He does 
check his reads extremely fast. Basically, a lot of things Justin Fields doesn't has not demonstrated so far. Justin Fields' flaws, we don't know how many percent of it is on Justin Fields and how many percent of it is on Luke Getze and the Bears developing him. But it's there in year three still, okay? And it was there at the beginning of year three. And I was like, geez, I hope they fix this this year. And then at the end of year three, there were still some plays. Justin Fields was just looking downfield and not being able to pull the trigger on a throw. But I've seen enough plays where there's an open receiver that Justin Fields just doesn't see them. I've gone through the A22 for every single game this last year, just from putting video together and whatnot. I don't want to say I've studied it per se, but I've seen it all multiple times. There's plenty of examples where, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, the O-line, the O-line, the O-line, he's getting sacked. Well, you know, there's a lot of avoidable sacks. A lot of times where he drops back and it even looks like he wants to pull the trigger and doesn't. And now it's chaos backyard football time sometimes that ends up with a positive play we saw way more of those positive plays in 2022 than we saw in 2023 but sometimes it ends up with a negative play sometimes it ends up with a fumble or a sack i i keep kind of going back to this comment that i said where i didn't think his floor would still be this low you know what are we hoping here for what are we holding on to here and at the end of the day you got to pay him next year he's gotten sacked 130 times in two and a half years um which is another part of it too you know, Andrew Luck can survive this league. He's on pace to double it. And I know at the beginning of the year, during the offseason last year, at least through mine and David's conversations, our idea was, well, okay, say it does fail or say, you know, he, you don't want to be stuck in the middle here. You could use the middle as a stepping stone, right? But say he does fail or say he's just average enough to where you're still scratching your head and questioning it. You have two first round picks. You could package them together and trade up to get whatever quarterback you want. Well, look at this. Now, number one literally fell into our lap. It's such a unique position to where you don't even have to do that. You could still take the best quarterback out there if you want, and you still have your number nine pick. You know what I mean? And that's really, really enticing, I think. The sentimental guy in me wants to keep Justin Fields, but we're in a business, man. And there's a clock on the contract situation, and I think it's time. I think it's time to get Caleb Williams. Cole Komet is no longer an experiment. That guy is a top 10, arguably top five tight end. Like the offensive line is not minus the center position, really. Not a bunch center of scrubs guard. anymore. Center and guard sometimes when they're yeah, hurt. But, but three this, out of five. You're, this you're isn't doing. a completely talentless team. The argument I understand is if you barely just missed the playoffs or you got bounced in the first round and it was clearly a lack of talent issue. You were nowhere near the level that you need to be. And part of that just has to lie in your quarterback, doesn't it? The fact that he can't make the other players around him look demonstrably better. I don't think there would be a lot of shock if you just came back with a better quarterback on this team and all of a sudden everyone looked a little bit better. It is what it is. And again, when you watch it, it kind of gets to fool you. Because you watch Justin Fields thing do things that you've never, ever seen done before, I think. right? There's a lot of sacks that I can't name a single quarterback. You could argue it's Michael Vick, Cam Newton. I've seen Justin Fields like break out of actual full-on tackles and run a 4-3-40 and like, go pick up 15, 18 yards. But it looks impressive, so it kind of fools the brain into thinking that's sustainable. I can't listen to you while you blindly support and don't acknowledge negatives. Because I'll have a conversation with you about it, but I can't just be like, he's the best. You're an idiot to move on. What are you doing? That's fine. And the argument to be made for more draft capital, I love that. I started with that argument, but the more I, you know, really, you work on draft capital so that you can get a quarterback eventually. More we draft did it so last can... year so we could be in the spot we're at today. <laughs> exactly. It's gambling with house money, right? The athleticism is so cool and it's so fun to watch, but it's not what's going to get you over the hump at this point people really don't like caleb williams being drafted because it's almost like an unknown commodity right and as if it's oh well this guy could bust well they keep acting as if justin fields is the known commodity if this is the known commodity and even if he gets 10 percent better you're still dealing with a bottom maybe 20th best quarterback in the league so you're you're hoping for a Now, year four leap with a brand new coordinator, with hopefully brand new pieces, brand new receivers, 
And then where do the excuses end? Well, now he needs to gel with those pieces. Well, now he needs another year with this coordinator. People acting like Justin Fields is the known commodity is to me the, the kind of delusional part. Even if you like Justin Fields' talent, has I don't think he's ever demonstrated four consistent games in a row, right? I don't think I've ever seen Justin Fields play four really good games of football in a row. And you can blame whatever you want for that, but that's why that Green Bay game did matter so much. Because if he yeah. would have been able to get a third win in a row, it would have it, it would have said something. It would the fact and, that he came out and just shh, nine points. And people keep talking about how this, you know, like he can take you there. He needs more talent and more support and this and that. Objectively speaking, ignoring all of his side notes and coordinators and all that, I've never seen the guy put together four consistent games in a row in the regular season, and I've watched every single game he's ever played. And now all of a sudden, just because he got some new players and some backup and a better coordinator, I don't see that now he's going to put together four consistent games in a row. Oh, and it's against all the best teams left, and it's in the most high-leverage, high-pressure situations left. And all of a sudden, it's just those two things don't compute to me. And people are just like, well, get him a new receiver and a new O-line and a new coordinator and give him some more stuff. And then another thing and another thing. And the guy hasn't even, like, Listen, sniffed the playoffs yet. It could happen, but people don't understand that. They're hoping for a miracle. Caleb Williams would have gone first overall in 15 drafts probably before this, before Andrew Luck, basically. And people acting like... Like, that's something that you, you should just go, eh, we don't need it. That's wild. They're using the same line against Justin Field at this point that they did against Mitch Trubisky. Make him play quarterback. You can't keep get, hoping for this ideal situation and act like it's realistic, but it's less realistic for Caleb Williams to just get drafted and be better than Justin Fields. It's less realistic for that to happen than to put together a super team in the next two to three years because you traded back a few picks? With Grant. That's more realistic? I don't think – like, you can point to a few of the NFL players who say, like, yes, this build around Justin Fields, analysts, say this, say that, say this, say that. Go be a fan of another team. I don't think anyone's banging down the door and saying, like, take our first and second for Justin Fields. I'm like, man, you guys are sure – that's why you're getting a second. Maybe Schefter said you might get a first if there's a bidding war or something like that. I still I highly heard, I heard second it. and a fourth. Second and a fourth. Yeah, is like and so that's why you're getting a second. Even the most diehard fan bases who need a quarterback, do you think they would actually take Justin Fields over Caleb Williams if the price was the same? And in this situation, the price is the same. You have that pick. Not only is the it price the same, into our you get to take it and still get draft compensation for Justin Fields. I haven't even talked about the money part, which Justin Fields starts at Daniel Jones. Financially, just so everyone knows, like maybe we can get him for a hometown discount. No, you're not. First of all, you don't even know how Justin Fields feels. Maybe he feels slighted at this point just by the slander in the media. And the conversation begins at Daniel Jones, which I believe is $40 million a year. One thing's for sure. I will not sit here and pretend that the quarterback position does not have a lot of room for improvement right now because it does. From the very first moment that we started, one of the things that's been talked about between us is that what matters most is our opinion. And we appreciate all of our subscribers. We appreciate every view we get. But that is not our number one prerogative here. We are not the guys that are just going to take the popular narrative and run with it like a lot of these content creators do. We're going to sit here and we're going to speak our minds whether it's popular or not. And let me tell you, I've gotten a lot, a lot of comments, some hateful, some logical, but a lot of people disagreeing with simple stuff like here's Justin Fields fumbles. And all of a sudden, it's like, you Caleb Williams lover, you this and that, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, dude, just showing you his fumbles. Just going to get it out there. If you have thin skin, this episode may not be for you. <laughs> like, caution, because um, I'm going to dive in a little bit today. Every week away from watching Justin Fields playing football, I think uh, helps me 
be content with the idea of moving on. And I think a lot of us who are who were Justin Fields fans are Justin Fields fans. I'm gonna say oh, we're like he's de- definitely gone. There's a world where he definitely stays and stuff. I'm okay. I've come to terms with every outcome possible. The love for watching Justin Fields play football and watching him every Sunday gets to be intoxicating. And I think the more weeks we don't watch him, the more clear the picture becomes for us. Recently got a comment that said, here's another imposter bears channel. That's truly just Caleb Williams fans. Yeah. We're 600 videos in and this has been our plan the whole time. (laughs) It's silly, right? The idea that Justin Fields is, is the bears is silly. Caleb Williams gets drafted. That fan is going to be the biggest Caleb Williams stan, worse than he was Justin Fields, because he all he cares about is like the moment. The one thing I keep hearing fans say, look at the 49ers. You got to build a team up just like the 49ers did. And then once you have the talent around everywhere, you could just plug any quarterback in there. I just sit there and I hear that and I cringe. They're discrediting Brock Purdy so much. I mean, that guy has been playing high level quarterback this entire year and last year. And I wasn't that high on him at the beginning of the year. Um, However, he's proved it and shown it that he can sit there and play in this league with the best of them to just sit there and say, you could toss anyone in there. Anyone like, I don't know, Jimmy Garoppolo or anyone like Trey Lance. So clearly even that team understands the importance of the quarterback position and getting it right. And they were willing to juggle it. They were willing to eat their mistakes after trading up for Trey Lance in order to get that position right you have to have it right it has to be set it's so important and i've had people tell me that i'm over crediting the quarterback position maybe i tend to think that it's extremely important i've just seen it too often and i know we even went back and forth on this in the beginning of the year dave where i was blaming justin fields from the start i said no 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 you have to play better yes there are other problems yes there's coaching yes there's talent yes there's offensive line issues things are gonna Never be perfect, but the quarterback position has to be set. A lot of excuses disappear once it is. Well, you need more weapons. Yeah, meanwhile, a team like the Chiefs is trading Tyree Kill away. Well, you know, Fields needs an offensive line. Well, you know what? The best quarterbacks have won while getting sacked. Aaron Rodgers won a Super Bowl being the most sacked quarterback. Joe, Joe Burrow was in a Super Bowl as the most sacked quarterback. You could sit there and overcome those obstacles, and we need better coaches. You know, coaches are totally tied to – the performance of the quarterback. Even recently, we have a guy like Sirianni that had, uh, in his second season, he had the number three total offense, the number three scoring offense. He toppled the league with uh, a team filled with pro bowlers, and they fell four points shy of a Super Bowl. And one year later now, people are talking that he's coming into this year on a hot seat. Yeah, great coaches, they matter, but they're directly tied to the play of the quarterback. Up until about week 14, Brock Purdy was the number one favorite for MVP. They're acting as if he's just handing the ball off all the time. The guy makes plays. The guy does, you know, do things that his predecessors weren't able to do. So, yeah, I'm big on the Brock Purdy being like a top 10 quarterback probably category. Um, And that's what you need. Another thing I hear all the time is, well, we should have won three games last year that we did it. You know, should have, could have, would have. You either did or you didn't. Every single team can make that argument. You can't sit there and make that argument. But you know what? Just to uh, just to talk about those three games, people reference Tampa Game Bay. Okay, so Getsy calls two screens in a row at the very end. Is it the best idea? No, but you throw a pick six. So so I get the play calling isn't great, but. That you can't just give the ball to the other team and let them score. You're better off taking a, a sack for a safety. I mean, you just you you mess that up. And then on top of it, he throws another pick after that while trying to target Chase Claypool. So should have won that game. Well, you didn't because Fields kind of effed it up. People don't want to sit there and admit it, but it's true. So the other game is the Broncos, where Fields had a great game, finally threw for four touchdowns, but but it did come with its huge negative so the bears still lost it's hard to sit there and criticize the guy when he has a four touchdown game but if 
we need you to be clutch, not the opposite. You can't just cough it up at the end. And now Getsy made a play call where there's a free rusher coming. Once again, is it the best plan? Probably not. But in the press conference after the game, Getsy stated that that was the plan. That they, that everybody should be on the same page. Fields needs to know that there is a free rusher coming because that is the play call. And, and so to sit there and fumble it and let the other team go and score a touchdown? that can't be the result of that either. And, and so even if the play call was bad, you still effed it up with the lions game, the bears collapse. Okay. The offense did very little to kill the clock in the fourth quarter. And then at the end of the game, 30 seconds to go, it that's a, it's an uphill battle, but fields is sacked for a fumble that gets kicked out for a safety. Okay. Now three points turns into five points down, but you were down three points with 30 seconds to go. There's quarterbacks in this league that take that as an opportunity. 30 seconds is not a lot of time, but what we saw is completely the opposite. We saw a guy just crumble in the moment. The clutch argument. People bring up like the Vikings game where the very pass at the end to DJ Moore was super sloppy. DJ Moore really made that catch. But people forget that the two drives leading up to that ended both with fumbles. And on top of it, we couldn't score a touchdown all game. We got lucky we won that game 12 tonight. And then you saw that same performance repeat in Green Bay at the end of the year. Part of, I think, the the emotional connection to Justin Fields is like hearing the rest of the teammates back him up, right? We want him back. We hear all these players saying that we move on from quarterbacks too quickly and this and that and the other. Yeah. Everybody but had what Chase are they Claypool's say? back. But everybody what had Chase. That's what right. I'm saying. So, like, everybody well, had Chase Claypool's back. You can't back. throw your teammates under the bus. Of course you can't. And I don't think anybody thinks the same way about Chase Claypool as they did about Justin Fields. But I don't think it was that different. I think they thought Chase Claypool was a decent guy and maybe he just didn't like click well with the team. And then Chase Claypool, the rest of his career kind of spoke for itself and he was what he was. There's no re there's nowhere near a comparison here. I don't think Justin Fields is anywhere near as bad as Chase Claypool as a player. I think Justin Fields will go somewhere and he'll be productive and he'll he'll be good enough to do the same stuff again. He will have some version of a quarterback controversy, man, Justin Fields, he's so talented here in Atlanta and Pittsburgh or whatever, but he's just, ah, something's just missing. Something's just that. And people can't comprehend the idea that maybe this is just what Justin Fields is. There are 15 quarterbacks in the NFL that are better than Justin Fields that are less physically gifted. And sometimes it is just kind of between the ears and maybe he will go somewhere and be better and just calm down and simplify my opinion is that Justin Fields needs like a whole year off. He should not be a starting quarterback in the NFL this year. He should probably go somewhere, learn a playbook, kind of forget that people care, maybe be a backup somewhere, and then he'll get a refresh. I think that might be the best thing for him, but I, I, I think he starts somewhere next year. I agree. I'm not saying that that's what I think will happen. I say that I think that's what's best for Justin Fields. But putting him out there again this year and putting him with better receivers – People keep talking about how he has a lack of talent, lack of this, lack of that. There's always an excuse to be made. But what if you give him all that talent and he flounders again, right? And yeah, obviously then you say, oh, well, then you just move on. But you've just, you just screwed yourself because you didn't draft a quarterback. Now you don't have those draft picks. You let Justin Fields stay. And now it looks even worse in retrospect, right? So It, it um, just happened. We, we need more weapons. We go off and get DJ Moore. What happens? Mooney's production drops so you didn't add dj Moore. you kind of had that production replaced and you upgraded upgraded the position right but like you did upgrade the position but but there's there wasn't enough to go around for everybody somehow some way right and that's what's the, that's what's like the scary stuff like cole Komet is no longer an experiment that guy is a top 10 arguably top five tight end like the offensive line is not Minus the center position, really. Not a bunch center of scrubs guard. anymore. Center and guard sometimes when they're yeah, hurt. But, but three this, out of five. You're, this you're isn't good. a completely talentless team. The argument I understand is if you barely just missed the playoffs or you got bounced in the first round and it was clearly a lack of talent issue. You were yes. nowhere near the level that you need to be. And part of that just has to lie in your quarterback, doesn't it? The fact that he can't make the other players around him look demonstrably better i don't think there will be a lot of shock if you just came back with a better quarterback on this team and all of a sudden everyone looked a little bit better it is what it is and again when you watch it 
it, it kind of gets to fool you because you watch Justin Fields thing do things that you've never, ever seen done before, I think. Right? There's a lot of sacks that I can't name a single quarterback. You could argue it's Michael Vick, Cam Newton. I've seen Justin Fields like break out of actual full-on tackles and run a 4-3-40 and like go pick up 15, 18 yards. But it looks impressive, so it kind of fools the brain into thinking that's sustainable. Listen, we're not just here to just talk fields down to nothing. He might be the best athlete in the NFL. Yeah. He, I mean, he is so physically gifted, you know, but even like listening to uh, Carmen Yurko earlier today, you know what Yurko said he wants from his quarterback? A brain and an arm. You know, that's that's what that position needs, right? So, like, when you start relying on your athleticism more than you're relying on your brain and your arm, you're st- you're not playing that position correctly anymore. And, you know, but I think that athleticism, that excitement, that's why people really want to hang on to them and say, well, we'll just give them time, just give them time. But in the past, those are not the things that have resulted in great quarterbacks. <laughs> It does feel like the Chicago media, though, has already begun to project their feelings about Caleb Williams and, you know, the hatred due to fields like you hear this whole he better perform or else narrative. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I think the best rookie season in, in NFL history, or at least in modern history, was Cam Newton in his first year. Um, and he had, uh, I believe, a little over 4,000 yards passing, 700 yards rushing. Uh, he had D'Angelo Williams and uh, Jonathan Stewart with him on that team. Um, his Steve team Smith and Steve, Yep, Steve Smith Sr. Uh, Greg Olson. Greg Olson. Yeah. And then the backup was uh, Jeremy Shockey. So he had some, some weapons on that team, and they still went 6-10, and 10, right? So Caleb Williams is a rookie, and – what do you think is the actual realistic type of projection here for this kid this year? The real expectations that you're looking at with Caleb Williams is he should be one of the better rookie performers we've seen at the quarterback position in some time. And the way that I say that is because having evaluated him, uh, I mean, I went through and watched every single one of the passes that he's thrown in college. So that's, kind of insane of me, but at the same time, it goes to show in in my process of watching him and identifying uh, his strengths and weaknesses, I see someone who can contribute at the NFL level right away, make an impact and eventually develop into a potential superstar player. There's a bit of expectation for him to perform very well because of that. There's a prominent media member who said that this is the best surrounding, like supporting cast that a number one pick a quarterback has had in the last 30 years at least. The fact that the number one pick didn't come from Chicago's own poor play, you're looking at now DJ Moore and Keenan Allen at wide receiver, an up-and-coming offense, a strong defense. There's a lot to like there in Chicago. So you're throwing in a a high-end blue-chip quarterback prospect. The expectation should be high. It's a rookie quarterback. Even the best rookie quarterbacks, even Andrew Luck coming out, even even Peyton Manning. I know that's 90s. It's basically a different game of football at that point. Even Andrew Luck, even Cam Newton, even Justin Herbert, even Joe Burrow, even Trevor Lawrence, all those highly touted quarterbacks who performed well, they made rookie mistakes. And I expect no different out of Caleb Williams. I expect him to be good. I expect him and believe he's going to be an upgrade at quarterback over Justin Fields. But at the same time, I feel like there has to be a level of realism and we need to keep a you know, a more level-headed approach in terms of what to expect out of a rookie quarterback uh, coming out of the gate. Jacob, do you know who uh, holds the rookie record for most interceptions? Most interceptions? Uh, 28 interceptions, yeah. rookie season. I'm going to guess because he's the first name I come to mind. I'm going to say Peyton Manning. It is Peyton Manning, and he is quoted to say that he's going to hold on to that record forever because <laughs> no one in this league now is patient enough to sit there and stick behind a quarterback. If they throw 28 interceptions in a rookie year, you're going to give up on them. So yeah. the, the contradictory thing is that now we have Keenan Allen, you have DJ Moore, you're going to add more pieces, but Caleb Williams is supposed to throw for 4,000 yards also, yet if he doesn't, he's a failure. So rather than giving him excuses as a rookie, we're going to be 
lambasting him or crucifying a, a rookie 23 year old, 22 year old for not having an outstanding performance as a rookie quarterback. He is a rookie. He should underperform your expectations, no matter what the situation he goes into anyway. I think it's unfair in the sense that the expectation now has gone into rookie records, NFL records, Bears records, right? 4,000 yards. 4,000 yards from a rookie is unrealistic, but if he doesn't do it by year two or year three, I would understand the criticism. Yes, you'd like him to perform really, really well, but at the end of the day, he is a rookie. So he's going to not meet your expectations. He's going to make some really bad mistakes. Do you think this narrative would still exist if it was Drake May or Jaden Daniels? Say the Bears do drop back from pick one to pick two and take Drake May. Is all of a sudden Drake May expected to have the best rookie season of all time? Maybe not as high of expectations as what we see with Caleb, but I still think that it's a matter of, oh, May better do really well or else. Daniels better do really well or else. I feel like regardless of who the quarterback would be, even if it's not Caleb, which I expect it to be, uh, those fans are still going to hold him to a very high level just because, all right, hey, you again, you got rid of the quarterback that I want. This new guy, it's like, all right, well, he better be good. You know, I tend to just look at certain stats and things like that. However, I never let it get too far. I never get carried away with just stats because to me, the eye test and the situational uh, circumstances matter a lot. But when I was looking at Justin Fields, one thing that stuck out to me is I I look year to year. I look at this uh, analytic that I call the chaos analytic, where I look at the total dropbacks Mm -hmm. that a guy has and then uh, compare it to the amount of pass attempts. So saying, hey, if the offensive coordinator calls a passing play and you drop back with the intent to pass, how often does the ball actually leave your hands versus it becoming a, a rush or a sack or a fumble, something else other than the ball leaving your hands, right? Yeah. And uh, when I broke this down into percentages, the best of the best of them can get around 4 5 6%. I mean, Brady in his last year was at like 4%, meaning only 4% of the time when a pass play was called, he wound up pretty much just getting sacked. I mean, Brady's not about to run it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, most of the league – is that around 10%? Some mm-hmm. of the more uh, mobile quarterbacks, you see 12, 13%. In Justin Fields' is three years, it went 29% or 24%, 29%, and 22%. Mm-hmm. So as an offensive play caller, yeah. one out of every five pass plays winds up being something else. And to me, that just shows inability, no control over an offensive scheme. And so, like, when you pair it up with the eye test, you, you see it. This kid is light years away from playing the position to the top-tier extent that some of these guys in this league play. Um, you know, even Patrick Mahomes said, hey, my first couple of years, I didn't know how to read defense. He's manipulating defenses now. He is. Yeah. He's straight up not only reading them, he is playing with these guys. Peyton Manning was the best of them to do it. And so I think that's one of the things that – is a problem with Justin Fields. It's like, yes, he's a great athlete. He's a good dude. He's a great character. He's got great work ethic, this and that. But when it comes to the quarterback position, I just haven't seen that control and from a guy who's played the position for years. You know, you'd think it'd be better. So I think even if Caleb comes in and has whatever kind of statistical season, for me, I, there's something to see in comfort out there. You know, when, when I've watched some of his highlights and things like that, I see a lot of comfort at the position from Caleb Williams. So I think a lot of the pressure on Caleb Williams is a projection of pressure that you used to have for Justin Fields, right? So when you look at what you expected out of Justin Fields, in year four out of a quarterback, you expect them to make significant strides, significant leaps, and get better and better and better. Whereas now you have a rookie quarterback, but you expect those projections and those leaps to be applied to the to the new guy because you expect him to be better at the position, right? Which yeah. at the end of the day is not fair. Over This isn't Madden, right? I don't even think Caleb Williams needs to be the best rookie quarterback in this draft class to still meet, in my mind, his expectations. He needs to be the best quarterback that the Bears have seen in a while. I think he needs to throw for 3,000, 3,500 yards and make it look, you know, uh, past the eye test, like you said, right? But in terms of what he needs to do to make this team make a playoff run or playoff push, I don't think that Caleb Williams needs to break any records. I don't think he needs to be the best quarterback or even like rookie of the year this year. 
it would be nice, but I don't think that's A, realistic, and B, what needs to happen. Mm -hmm.